From the CISO series, it's cybersecurity headlines. The never ending nightmare that is Windows Print Nightmare 2 Electric Boogaloo, Amazon DNS attack method, allows for nation state level spying and a crypto theft with a twist. The thief funds steal some of the money. These are some of the stories that my colleagues and I have been bringing you on this week's cybersecurity headlines. And now we get a chance for some insight, opinion, and dare I say, some expertise on these stories and more from our guest, Ben Sapiro, the CISO with Canada Life. Ben, thank you so much for being here. Looking forward to getting into the stories. Uh, thanks for having me. All right. We also want to thank our sponsor, Sotero. We'll be hearing more from them in just a minute. And remember, you can join us on Crowdcast. We have the URL up there. Uh, I don't know how directions work. There we go. And uh, we'll be doing this in about 20 minutes. So join us there. Leave us some comments. We would love to see them regardless of where I'm pointing at the URL. So our first story, let's get it started here. An actively exploited bug bypasses authentication on millions of routers. A critical authentication bypass vulnerability is impacting home routers with the Arcadian firmware that will allow for the deployment of Mirai botnet malicious payloads. With a rating of 9.9 out of 10, this poses threats to millions of routers from or connected to ASUS, British Telecom, Deutsche Telecom, Orange, O2, Verizon, Vodafone, Telstra, and TELUS, kind of the, the who's who of anyone that you'd be connecting to. The security flaw was discovered by Tenable, and most disturbingly, Tenable says that this vulnerability has existed in the supply chain for at least 10 years. 10 years, that's Ben, that's, that's some time. Uh, what does this say about you know, kind of other undiscovered vulnerabilities. Is this, I guess in, in Rumsfeldian terms, is this a known unknown or an unknown known? And is there anything that we can we can do about this at this point? Well, I mean, the, these the short kind of answers is yes, there are th for sure. I mean, the short answer is yes, of course, there are things we can do about these. But you know, there's only two types of vulnerabilities in the world. Those have been exploited and those who have yet to be discovered um, or disclosed, I guess is more accurate these days. I. Look, there's always going to be vulnerabilities latent somewhere in the code and people won't trip across them until they go and look. And that's just the nature of it. You have hundreds of thousands of lines of code and it takes time for people to discover it. And, you know, as much as lots of eyes make the problem shallow, especially when it comes to proprietary code, that statement is far less true because there are much fewer eyes to solve that problem. So, you know, are there more out there? Absolutely, there are, especially when you're dealing with embedded technology, you know what they call it, the Internet of Terrible Stuff, although perhaps they use different words. <laughs> um, there are more out there unequivocally. And the short answer is, is that we just have to keep on looking. And you know, I think the good news here is, is that somebody found it before it was turned into something far worse than it could have been. All right. Our next story here maybe something to prevent some horrible things. Passwords of three random words, better than complex variation, at least experts say. The National Cyber Security Center, part of the UK's government communications headquarters, said a three-word system creates passwords that are easy to remember and creates unusual combination of letters enough to keep online accounts secure from cyber criminals. Although the agency's director, Dr. Ian Levy, conceded people might still use predictable word combinations. So uh, we're, we are always the weak link in the system uh, here, Ben. But when we're, when we're talking about, you know, password security, there's always that classic convenience versus security kind of spectrum that we have to think on. Is this approach preferable to something like a password manager, that single point of single point of failure where you can have a lot of complexity versus something that people actually have a possibility of holding in their head? So my view is that this isn't really about the argument against password vaults or password managers versus this. I think it's more really about the idea of long, complex passwords that we ask people to somehow memorize, but they never quite do versus something that's accessible. And this practice that Dr. Levy is putting forward is going to encourage people to produce longer passwords, unless, of course, they're going for cat, bat, hat, and certainly <laughs> that's not recommended either. But you do get an increase in the strength of password through this. So I think it's definitely a step in the right direction. Um, you know, we spent years, and I'm stealing from uh, the uh, famous comic uh, XKCD, we've spent years of teaching ourselves to remember complex passwords that are easy for computers to guess their way through, let's do something different and you know, uh, horse correct battery, battery stapler or some combination <laughs> of that. That's the right way to go. But I really think it's kind of missing the point of passwords themselves are a failed authentication mechanism and we wanna see multi-factor absolutely wherever we, everywhere we go. That we know is a reliable way to do this. So this is a great thing to move in the right direction, but really I'd like to see 
um, the UK government, for NSCSC and everybody else encouraging people to multi-factor as much as possible. Multi-factor, all the things indeed. Uh, next, story, <laughs> next story here. New uh, Amazon DNS attack method allows for nation state level spying. Uh, Wiz presented this at Black Hat uh, just this last week, registering a domain with a name such as ns-852-awsdns-42.net, catchy, I know, and adding it uh, and adding in AWS Route 53 to the DNS server with the same name gave them insight into DNS traffic for more than 15,000 organizations. Effectively, it's pointing them back at Amazon's own uh, 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 DNS servers. They weren't blacklisted, including Fortune 500 companies, 45 U.S. government agencies, and 85 government agencies from other countries. The intercepted data included internal and external IP addresses, computer names, usernames, and office locations. The researchers equate this to nation state level spying. Sounds like cloak and dagger stuff. Is this an unusual discovery? And, and what kind of, I guess, uh, surface area in terms of information exposed are we looking at here, Ben? This is, and I love that the the researchers referenced uh, the late Dan Kaminsky. You know, DNS is a, a wild and wacky place, and certainly he did a lot to highlight the issues here. But this isn't really new stuff. You know, whether it's uh, you know improperly secured um, routing protocol announcements, so BGP, for example, and people taking over routing to, to other people's networks, or DNS manipulation. These sorts of capabilities have existed for a long time. And I think really at the core of it, you're looking at it, the internet is generally a collection of networks. We could describe it as that. Um, where there's a limited amount of, I'll call it security reliance, you should be making on things. In this particular case, this is sort of the unexpected intersection of a very predictable way of searching for domain uh, domains that the Windows computers need to access intersects with the concentration issue of a DNS provider, which is used by a lot of people. So could it enable a lot of data collection? Sure, but mechanisms to do something like this have existed. This happens to just be another implementation of it. And I think ultimately what you should be looking for is um, when somebody says, hey, I'm going to rely on information in the network, do you know that your network is properly or your endpoints are authenticating those sources before they initiate communication? So I think it's novel, but I don't think it's particularly new. Uh, and I think this is really just the intersection of a number of different character, uh, attributes within the, the technology world coming together to produce an unexpected outcome. But I wouldn't sort of ring the alarm bell about this. And really, if we're talking about nation state actors then misbehaving, they've already got those <laughs> capabilities. So let's fix this. Let's move on. Well, speaking of novel, now we need to worry about power LEDs. The mad scientist slash security researchers at Ben Gurion University's Cyber at BGU team published details about a novel, a passive form of the Tempest attack called Glowworm, which converts minute fluctuations in the intensity of power LEDs back into audio signals that cause the fluctuations. Now, these fluctuations are not perceptible by the human eye. This isn't uh, like your hard drive light or something like that, kind of blinking back and forth. But these can be read by a photo dialed coupled to a simple optical telescope, or as I like to call it, a telescope. Then it's run through an analog to digital converter for direct playback. You can just hear the audio. Because because this is completely passive, it would not be picked up by any electronic countermeasure sweep. Again, kind of more of a cloak and dagger potential kind of story. Some interesting limitations here, like it can't actually, if you're listening to a conference call, for example, you wouldn't actually hear the audio in the room, only what was over the phone. But I guess, do we have to bust out the electrical tape for all of our LEDs here for, for things that we, we can't have anyone listening to here, Ben? Or, or you know, is, is this... I, I, for these kind of stories, like Ben Gurion University puts out these kind of stories once a year, it seems like, whether it's your hard drive light, the sound of your hard drive can use to be exfiltrate data or other weird air gap defeating measures. Will there always be something that we just can't see of? And, and I guess, how do we approach these kinds of security stories? Well, this all really asks the question of what's your threat model that you're operating in. I mean, the vast majority of us do not operate in a world where Tom Clancy's, you know, inspired, you know, actors are coming in and trying to kick down our door or do things for the vast majority of us. This is, yeah, this is interesting. And, you know, maybe you want to have your most sensitive meetings where you want to have bug sweeps happening and things like that. But for the vast majority of organizations, you know, this is not how you're going to get yourself undone. Um, I don't think that this is actually particularly novel. If you look at, you know, you mentioned the hard drive one. Um, prior to that, there were concerns about keyboard uh, vibrations and the sensors on phones. Going back a couple of years, it was the uh, the light on your modem or on your network device would blink at the frequency of the data, and so that would also expose information. Um, all of this has happened before, all of it happened again, and it really comes down to what threat model are you in? If you are the NSA, then absolutely this is a concern. 
if you're in a heavily, you know, espionaged uh, industrial activity, so then, yeah, sure, maybe. But as you start moving into the general, like probably 90% of the population and 90% of the world corporations, is there really a scenario where somebody's setting up an, a camera and an optical telescope, sorry, a telescope? <laughs> eh, I, I think we have more, re, you know, more mundane and more regular things to worry about. All right. And now we need to thank our sponsor, Sotero, and they have a great new resource you need to check out. It's a new CISO security brief that helps you cut through all the vendor noise and zero in on the best data security solutions for your requirements. It includes info on data security technology advances, tips to help you meet your security requirements, and a new rapid development capability so your development team can implement security features much much faster. To get the brief, just go to soterosoft.com and click on the link at the top of the page. All right, our next story here in the Week in Review, a notorious darknet market comes back to life, a Franken market, if you will. The Alphabet dark web market has resurfaced. It was the largest darknet market before being shut down by law enforcement in July 2017. The title of largest darknet market seems to fluctuate uh, <laughs> pretty rapidly these days. One of its administrators named De Snake announced on a dark web forum that the Alpha Bay is now open for business and claims the platform is built to last with secure audited code, hardened servers, and safeguard against disruptions caused by hardware failure, police raids, or seizures. I imagine two of those will be much more common than the other. A list of items prohibited for sale on Alpha Bay includes firearms, ransomware, pornography, doxing, and COVID-19 vaccination information. The site has long-term plans for creating a platform allowing anyone to set up a dark net market with a strong focus on anonymity. So we have a new and improved marketplace here, Ben, built to last. Interesting to see, I, I guess, the dark net kind of ad adopting security best practices and also kind of a open source franchisee uh, methodology. It, you know, anything interesting that we should take on this in terms of, you know, uh, uh, threat actors kind of using this, uh, this kind of approach similarly? Yeah, sure. I'd ask an important question first. If the list of prohibited items they have there, what exactly will they sell that's worthy <laughs> of the dark market uh, or dark web? But but that aside, look, I don't think that the way that these things fall down is generally around you know code that's not adequately secure and adequately hardened service. Although certainly there have been reports of those cases where law enforcement's been able to take advantage of those failings. It, typically, this happens through good old fashioned police work, where Law enforcement engages in some activity to entrap a criminal or would-be criminal, and then they get to them through the real world, um, through their associates and what have you. And so uh, built to last, maybe through a franchise model, you'll see proliferation of this particular environment but uh, or, or, tech, or, or technology stack. But I think you know, the actual operators are just as susceptible. Um, I, in fact, think that even if you're dealing with a situation where they are franchising out, where they're offering this to more people, there's an increased chance of something bad happening to individual operators because OPSEC starts degrading the larger the population of administrators. And Ben, I just checked my notes. They'll be selling drugs. Yes, lots and lots of drugs, I would assume. That's usually the top thing on these marketplaces. Uh, the U hmm. Next story up here, the U.S. Senate sends infrastructure bill to the House. The U.S. Senate passed its bipartisan infrastructure bill to the House of Representatives this week after a 69 to 30 vote. The bill dedicates $1 trillion to infrastructure improvements over the next 10 years, but through controversy, easy for me to say, controversy from the crypto community due to a pay for that anticipates raising $28 billion from a broadened crypto tax provision. The provision expands the definition of a broker, leading to concerns that the IRS might seek to impose broker information reporting requirements on non-broker entities, specifically miners or what a lot of people are worried about. Uh, so, Ben, you know, uh, making crypto more legitimate on, with, with this bill, kind of bringing them into, hey, you can now pay the government, congrats, here's your legitimacy card. Or is it simply going to just result in miners and exchange houses going underground, hey, maybe checking out some darknet marketplaces? Uh, two words, Al Capone. They got him through taxes. <laughs> this will happen here too. I, the, there was sort of, you know, the, 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 the crypto anarchist dream of, well, we won't have to pay taxes and we can disintermediate this, that, and the other thing and free from government until your entire ecosystem that you rely on to survive does not depend on the real world and fiat currency. Yeah, this was always going to happen. So I actually think that the good news is here is for folks engaged in crypto mining, that this opens avenues to more legitimacy. Uh, they'll discover the rules they have to play by, just as larger financial institutions did over the last you know, 100 years or so. 
Uh, I don't think there's really a scenario where the miners and the exchanges really get to go underground because, again, you want to connect it back to it. In summer, you're going to have to report in your Schedule C of your IRS filings or Section 13,000 of your Canadian government tax filings your other income. It's going to show up somewhere. So I don't think you go underground for long. On the plus side, you can now write off all the GPUs you're buying so that I can't build a gaming <laughs> PC. Thanks, crypto. Uh, next up here for our, our, our penultimate story here on the show, the Poly Network Hacker as a change of heart. Speaking of crypto, we reported uh, this week the hack of the decentralized finance platform Poly Network saw over $600 million worth of crypto assets stolen, frowny face emoji. Well, the attacker seems to have a change of heart and is in the process of returning the stolen tokens. The block reported uh, uh, as of Wednesday that $254 million worth of assets had been returned. And later in the week, basically everything had either been returned or had been put in a shared crypto wallet with Poly Network. Researchers at Slumbus reportedly were able to trace the culprit's email, IP address, and a Chinese cryptocurrency exchange used to move the assets. So not great news. The attacker indicated in crypto transactions that the refund that uh, in the refund uh, that they were issuing that the hacker is ready to surrender. That's a quote. Then today, Poly Network announced it wants to pay the hacker a $500,000 bug bounty for discovering the flaw, saying that we've also come to a more complete understanding regarding how the situation unfolded, as well as Mr. White Hat's original intention. Lots of twists and turns here. There has to be more to this story that someone finds a vulnerability in the contract management software or something like that, steals $600 million worth of crypto, returns it, and they want to give him a reward or him or her a reward. Right, Ben? There has to be more to this, right? Yeah. So I I certainly can't comment on Poly and the people that run the Poly smart contract. But if you think about crypto for a second in the prior story, everything's ultimately traceable in the crypto network. There isn't really hiding. There's some idea of anonymity, but once that's peeled back, you can link transaction to transaction to transaction and transaction probably far better than you can in the real world. Uh, so this Poly story actually, you know, in the early days of it or early hours, I suppose it's not that old, uh, Poly announced, hey, here's the wallet addresses that we saw this 600 million stolen amount of crypto assets going to. Please nobody take any transactions from them. And so right there, you're starting to get a problem where those assets are no longer necessarily executable within the Poly or other cryptographic currency networks. So I think that this is probably a combination of a bunch of things, an opportunistic theft, probably not a lot of well-planned uh, you know, ability to exfiltrate the information. Um, yes, it's blacklisted. Sorry, that's not the right term. Sorry, that's, it's the, you, know, you can't transact on it anymore because people have flagged those uh, addresses. And so maybe what you get ultimately is somebody turning to the crypto uh, hacker and going, or, 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 the, or the hacker, I guess, is more accurate and saying, you know, look, if you return the majority of this and we'll give you a finder's fee and we'll call it a day, and so their network wins because the, if they don't recover this transaction, then they're down 300 million, 350 million and change. Um, and that's going to have an impact on the network overall, although reportedly the price has only dropped slightly within the network. So I think the more to it is, is that this individual suddenly found it very hard to exit this currency into real world money or other networks and spend it. And now that they or she, they are disclosed, they're incentivized to maybe play nice and make nice. That being said, I think that, you know, having bug bounties, encouraging people to do the right thing, we know that has a positive effect on security. And and so maybe the motivations are wrong here, but maybe that does signal to people, hey, you can get some amount of money clean if you do the right thing versus be hunted the rest of your life. (laughs) I think the equation's easy. The the math uh, finally adds up uh, for, for Poly Network there. And our last story of the week in review, Print Nightmare Patch is just a lucid dream. At the beginning of this week, we reported that Print Nightmare Saga appeared to be at an end thanks to an update for Windows 10 that requires people to have administrative privileges to install print drivers with the point and print feature. But then on Wednesday, Microsoft issued a warning about yet another unpatched privilege escalation and remote code execution vulnerability in the Windows print spooler arising from an oversight and signature requirements around that pesky point and print capability. And now it's being weaponized by a ransomware gang. The operators of the Magnipper ransomware are exploiting the situation, but for the time being, it seems like this is only active in South Korea. I mean, I'm sure that's just a matter of time. Uh, so, but Ben, my question is, you know, we don't want to be armchair quarterbacks here, but why is this principle or vulnerability being so troublesome for Microsoft? 
Well, I mean, from years of tech support, I can tell you printers are evil and that's the only reason. No, I I think if we look back to, I think it was around the June timeframe, the, the first uh, announcements about Print Nightmare were actually accidental. Yeah. And so that puts Microsoft in the back foot. Uh, this, this really does speak a lot to coordinated vulnerability disclosure, responsible disclosure. Uh, an error was made here by accident. This thing got out earlier than Microsoft was intending to release information about it. And so had to hurry up on the patches and with all software development, inevitably, when you hurry, you're going to make mistakes. Um, it's also pretty tricky because you you want to make sure that your users, when you're in a Windows world, that they, the printers can be installed by the users because that's a very normal behavior. Um, and so how do you secure this in a way that doesn't give excess privileges, but at the same time allows users to have that experience they've been used to? And that's going to be a tricky thing to navigate, I think, for Microsoft. All right, before we get out of here, was there a, a thumbs up or something that made you roll your eyes? One of the stories that really stood out to you today, Ben? Oh, I, I absolutely love the, the the Poly Network story and the crypto thefts. I, I think that's an absolutely interesting study uh, in secure software gone wrong because each of these contracts is a <laughs> smart contract. They're a, they are a piece of software and it's demonstrating if you don't get it quite right. It's also a very interesting exercise in uh, uh, I'll call it DeFi, decentralized finance, learning the hard lessons that, you know, I'll call it old school finance, uh, classical finance has learned over a century plus. So I really am fascinated by those stories. It's watching things being relearned again by a new generation. Well, thank you so much, Ben. Uh, as a reminder, Ben Sapiro, CISO at Canada Life. Where can people find you uh, if they want to follow you, learn more about you if you're more uh, LinkedIn is a great place to find me. All right. Well, we'll be looking for you there. And thank you also to our sponsor, Sotero. Remember, cybersecurity headlines is available every single day. If you got about six minutes, you can keep up to date on your cybersecurity headlines each and every day. But you can also catch the weekend review to get the highlights as well. We'll be coming on back next week for our Friday video chat, Hacking Anomalous Behavior, an hour of critical thinking on when user actions raise the red flag. It starts at 10 a.m. Pacific. 1 p.m. Eastern, followed by cybersecurity speed dating. And then we'll be back with another edition of the Week in Review, 12.30 p.m. Pacific, 3.30 p.m. Eastern. Until then, I'm Rich Straffolino. Have a super sparkly day. Cybersecurity headlines are available every weekday. Head to CISOseries.com for the full stories behind the headlines. 